Hey everybody, this is Steli Efti with Closeout, and in today's video, I'm gonna tell you our story of how we transition from a services business to a software business. And one of the biggest mistakes, or a number of biggest mistakes that I see a lot of services businesses make as they attempt the transition from one type of business to the other. Now first, I get tons of emails uh, every week where people ask me, hey Steli, I know that you guys transitioned from Elastic Sales that was a services business to Close.io, which is a SaaS, a software as a service business, and you've done it very, very successfully. Can we jump on a call? Can you tell us how you did it, how you managed the transition? Because we also want to move away from running a services business. We want to build a software business. How do we do this in the best way possible? And I've been you know, giving my advice freely to lots and lots of founders and eventually thought maybe I should record this as a quick video and share my knowledge with you so more people can benefit from it. So a little bit about uh, the background. First, why do a lot of services business have the desire and the dream and the goal to move to a software business? Most of the time it's because there's this um, idea that a software business is going to be a lot more scalable um, it's going to have a lot higher multiple to the valuation of the business. Um, so, you know, if you want to sell the business or if you want to IPO, it's much easier to do so with a product or a software business than with a services company. And it's just a sexier thing. So a lot of people that start a services business, they get the benefits of running one, which is that you can you get up and running fairly quickly. You can start generating cash flow really, really early and fast. Um, and so they, they, they fall in love at the beginning and then they get a little heartbroken once they get to a certain level of scale and they run into a bunch of scalability issues and growth pains, growing pains with the services business, you know, hiring people, managing cash flow, um, managing churn with customers as they grow and all that stuff makes them a little heartbroken. And during the entire time, they're reading these, these tech news and blogs about these like multi-billion dollar software businesses that you know, grew in valuation and made everybody rich. And you do that for a little while and eventually you start dreaming, hey, maybe we need to set up a transition from one side to the next. There's very prominent um, examples of companies like Basecamp that went from a services to a software business. Um, Close is another prominent example. Uh, there's a bunch of, of them. And I think that, that so so... It's just a very sexy story and a lot of people are thinking about this and the grass is always green on the other side. So let me first set the context and tell you how Elastic Sales went from a services business to Close.io, a software business. And then let me share some of the common mistakes that I've seen founders make as they attempt that transition and hopefully you're going to be able to avoid these mistakes and do better in the transition. All right, so to set the stage, um, when we started, we started as Elastic Sales. And Elastic Sales, the idea was that we would offer B2B startups in Silicon Valley that had raised a Series A, a sales team on demand. We would offer sales consulting and we would offer outsourced sales services to B2B startup tech companies. Uh, we did that fairly successfully for over 200 venture-backed startups. And when we started, we never had the dream or the goal or the, you know, the, 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 the vision that we wanted to move away from the services business to a software business. We started the services business and from day one, we started developing software internally because of two reasons. One, two of my co-founders were developers, engineers. So we had engineering resources, we had developer resources. So instantly we thought, what could we, what nail could we hammer with those hammers, right? What could we do with these resources? And so from, from the get-go, we thought, well, if we want to build this massive services organization and we have this huge sales force on demand, sales team that companies could plug in and skill up and down and all that, Maybe we should build software that allow us to scale this huge sales organization uh, for our clients. So that was one very vague idea. And the second uh, reason why we started developing software from the get-go was that I was the first salesperson we were renting out. And I hated, with a passion, all the sales software that was out there, all the CRMs that were out there. And I didn't want to have to use them eight, nine hours of my day because I thought I'd be suicidal and jump off a bridge or something. So... You take those two reasons, A, sales software sucks, and we're gonna to have to use lots of it because we're hiring all these salespeople for our clients, and two, we have two people that are developers, equals 
you know, conclusion three, which is let's just build software. And the software is going to be a secret sauce that is going to allow us to scale the services company. That was the reason we started developing software from day one, although we were running a services company. Now, that was it. That was as much vision you know, as we put into this, or as much thought or strategy, strategery. Um, so, you know, when people ask me today, Steli, how did you guys decide to go into the CRM space? I tell people, you know, by not deciding, we just stumbled into that space. We really did not at any point decide, wow, the CRM space is ready for disruption. Let's go and get them. It just kind of organically happened. We just built something internally for our own needs. And honestly, for the first six to nine months, the software was not that great. And we didn't really have a point of view. We, we, as I said, we only knew everything else sucks and we should build something that helps our salespeople do better. But then, because our engineering team was sitting in the middle of our sales team and we had this unique feedback loop of having salespeople turn around to the engineers and go, do you see this shit at my screen? Do you see what I have to go through? Why do I have to make that, that many clicks? Why is this so complicated? And on the reverse, engineers would tap the salespeople on their, on their shoulder and go, why the hell are you doing all this complicated shit on your screen? Or why do you have all these pieces of paper? Or why do you you know, do all this manual data entry and you put in all these like shortcuts for the data entry and we know that this data is wrong? That kind of two-sided feedback loop started um, really helping us develop a unique piece of software. And also on top of it, we were, we were doing 200 different sales campaigns. So we saw all kinds of different sales setups. Uh, we saw all kinds of different sales cycles and sales use cases. We were looking at the CRMs of all our clients and saw all the things that were wrong with them. So that gave us kind of a very unique point of view. And I now joke that we had kind of a, a sales lab at the heart of Silicon Valley. And it allowed us bit by bit to actually gain clarity over the big vision for our product. And we started realizing, you know what? Sales software needs to be communication software. Because at its heart, sales is nothing else than result-driven communication. So software that says it's sales software needs to be communication software. It can't just be a, a contact database or reporting engine. And we also realized, <coughs> excuse me, that salespeople hate manual data entry. Because they hate it, they find ways around it or they find shortcuts for it. And that means that they fill up CRMs with bad data. And it, it, so, so it pollutes the CRM with shitty data and the salesperson is being slowed down in their productivity versus accelerated in their productivity. We realized that we wanted to do all this differently and bit by bit, the product started really becoming better and better and the software that we internally had started becoming really strong. And eventually two things happened. Our sales reps would show the software to some of our clients that heard, had internal sales teams as well as augmenting their sales teams with us. And the clients would reach out to us and say, hey, we want to buy the software as well, not just the services. And then our sales reps would also so show the software to their friends that were in sales and would brag about it and go, hey, only people that work at Elastic Sales can use this awesome piece of software. And then their friends would start pinging us and telling us they also are interested in purchasing this sales software. So when you have salespeople try to sell you on selling them your sales software, you might be onto something, right? And, and so we, we internally started growing our confidence. Hey, maybe the software is going to be the future of the business or maybe we have something special here on our hands. The market started showing us early signals that there's a demand for it. And honestly, internally, we had a champion. The, the, the engineering team started championing the product needing to be released and launched as a separate piece of the business. I resisted that idea. I was the CEO of the services company, and the last thing I needed and wanted was to run a separate business as well. Like I was already overwhelmed by running a services company. So I didn't really want to you know, run a software business at the same time in parallel. But you know, the person with the highest level of clarity always wins. And I've written about this and talked about this before. Phil, who is today our head of product and was our head of product back then as well. He had a high level of clarity on that we needed to launch the software ASAP. So it would bother me day in and day out, mornings, you know, uh, at lunchtime in the afternoon, at all opportunities, he kept bugging me. We need to launch the software. We need to launch the software. And eventually I gave in. We said, all right, good. Let's take two months. This is the room, four people. Launch it in January, go. And that's what we ended up doing. And honestly, if today the story was that we launched a really awesome CRM and sale, piece of sales software, but nobody gave a fuck in the market, nobody cared, nobody purchased it, and it ultimately failed, 
I wouldn't have been surprised, right? Because just having a better product is oftentimes not enough. But we launched and it was a fairly successful first month. And then the second month was even better than the first month. And the third month was even better than that. And within six to seven months, it was pretty clear that, holy shit, we have a winner on our hand. And the software would surpass the services business in terms of revenue, although the software business had a much smaller team attached to it. So that's when we realized that we should focus all our attention on the software and transition out of the services business and fully focus on the software. And really that what happened. We launched the software, closed.io in January 2013. And then a year later, in January 2014, we'd fully transitioned out of Elastic Sales, fully transitioned out of all our services clients, and we're fully focused on closed.io and our software and have been ever since. So that was kind of the, our transition from one thing to the next. And one funny thing that happened was that what we call the slowest or the, the, the least scalable growth hack of all times is that the moment that we realized that we were to transition out of the services business, we knew that we had all these salespeople that we had no use for on the software side and that we would have to let go in some smart way. And, and I've written about how we did that and they all ended up, because we treated them really well, be part of what we call the Elastic Mafia and part of the extended family. But also they all turned to become directors of sales, sales managers, VPs of sales, and all these clients of ours. And they turned around and they became instant customers. All of them became our customers. All the ex-Elastic Sales sales reps became close our customers, um, the least scalable uh, growth hack of all times. And they more than, uh, important than just them being customers, they became advocates and they became friends and we're still very close to all of them. Um, they're part of the fa extended family. And, and so that, that was kind of our story from services business to software business. Now, the big caveat here is that I don't think that our story is necessarily translatable to you, right? Um, especially if you run a services business today and you know you want to get away from it, you have had enough of it, you can't do what we did because what we did was very organic. As I said, we just kind of stumbled into it. We built something for ourselves and because of our setup, we did not have just one use case, but we were running many, many other use cases. And what we built for ourselves was the right thing for the world, hit a nerve, and had instant product market fit, so we were very successful out the gate. Um, we also had the benefit that we stayed in the same space. So first we were a thought leader in how to do sales for startups, and then we built software and marketed it to startups that wanted to do better sales. You see how that works really, really well together? We'd established a brand in, in the startup and SaaS space as sales thought leaders, and it helped us. That brand helped us incredibly in launching the sales software that we had built. All those benefits really made a big difference in how successful Close.io was, and I think, I'm not sure if everybody can just use that as a template for themselves, but I wanted to share it freely with the world. Now, let me get to the mistakes I see a lot of companies do when they want to move from services to software business. The biggest mistake, one of the biggest, or the biggest two mistakes that I see is number one, is that because you made the decision, you have a forced timeline. You, you know, you say, well, in 2018, we're going to move to a software business. And then you see, and we have three ideas for products and we're going to find product market fit and then we're going to fully transition away from the services business. The reason why I think that's a bad idea is because you don't know how long it's going to take you to find product market fit. You don't know. There's no, you cannot force the timeline for this. You can say we're going to be spending 30% of our resources every single month on developing software, doing product development, doing customer development. And once we find the right product for the right market, then we're going to really pu put fuel to the fire. And once we hit this amount of revenue, then we're going to transition out of the services business. But that could take six months, it could take 12 months, or it could take two and a half years. You don't know how quickly, you can't force that. You can't just say, I'm deciding I'm going to be a software business tomorrow. In most cases, this is a very bad idea. The reason why it's a bad idea is because you are going to try to convince yourself that you found product market fit before you truly found it. You're going to convince yourself that you're ready to launch a piece of software before it's really confirmed. You're going to be doing customer development and customer interviews, and you're going to hear what you want to hear because you're on a timeline and because you're really sick of running the services business and because it's already the fourth quarter of the year and you still haven't transitioned. So you're going to make the mistake to 
jump to conclusions, not listen carefully enough, not being open-minded enough, not really following organically the clues that your customers are laying out for you until you found something that's truly right for you and your customers in the market. And you're going to try to hard transition to a software business prematurely with something that doesn't have product market fit. Then you're going to force marketing on it and sales on it because now you're already committed and you're not seeing early results. So you're going to force, try to force the results, which means spending too much money and resources and time and energy on something that's already not working. And by the time you realize that you're probably going to be in trouble revenue-wise, money-wise, team-wise, morale-wise, and you're probably going to be in trouble brand-wise as well and reputationally as well. That's kind of the transition I've seen a lot of times. It's a forced transition. I know that it's hard not to do that, but that's what you need not to do if you want to succeed in that transition. Um, a lot of times, because you've already made up your mind that you want to transition really, really fast, you start dipping in terms of the quality that you offer to your services clients. You don't care that much anymore. You're like, yeah, 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 whatever services clients. They might be paying the bills and paying the rent and paying everybody's salary, but but we know we don't care about that shit. We know we don't want to do that long term. So you're going to just not pour as much love and care into your service clients as you should, which then will create problems on the services side, which then will create problems in your reputation, your brand, which then will create problems in your morale because employees internally will feel shitty about all these customers that are unhappy, all, all about, about all the shortcuts that you started taking with them. Just a shitty thing to do. Um, and then, you know, the transition that you're trying is going to be too rough and too, too painful because you're not, it's not an organic transition. It's a forced transition. So you might dip your services clients too quickly. And then the software business is not running enough, is not growing fast enough. It's not generating enough cash flow, And you now have cash flow problems or issues. Then you start thinking, well, maybe now that we're a software business, maybe we should just quickly go and fundraise seems like software businesses have an easy time to fundraise, right? And then you go out there and you try to fundraise a little bit as, as well as trying to grow your software business a little bit as well as try to keep running your services business a little bit. And you'll do all these things really, really poorly. And you're not going to raise money really quickly and easily. And then you run into cash problems and you might run out of business because of it. Um, so, and then oftentimes, you know, software growth, it takes time. Even with Closeout, where we had product market fit pretty much from day one, and we had already a pretty big reputation, a big email list, all that with so many things in our favor, it took, a whole, it took a whole year for us to transition away from software to services and for the software business to grow to a degree where it matched the services revenue. For most companies that are not as successful on the services side, don't have as big of a brand, it might take two years to make that transition happen. Software, especially SaaS, it has a slow growth curve at the beginning, a compounding growth curve at the beginning. So it might t easily take you 6, 9, 12 months before you really start having any type of significant revenue. And so you need to plan realistically. And oftentimes, again, because you have so much wishful thinking that have accumulated because you are on a forced timeline, you're impatient and you come up with unrealistic goals for the software. And you go, well, we're going to launch the software this month. And in four months, it should be at 150K in monthly recurring revenue. And then we can just shut down the services business. That might happen and it might not, right? Um, be careful with what kind of expectations you have. Because usually, most SaaS companies, they grow a little slower in the beginning than we all would like, right? And you need to plan for that. So what's my advice to summarize, if you want to move from services to software, I think you have a unique opportunity. You have an opportunity to be do, making that transition and financing it, funding it through customer revenue. It's a beautiful thing because you keep more ownership in your business. It's a beautiful thing because you're already building a brand, a reputation, an email list, a customer base on the services side that you're going to be able to use on the software side. It's a beautiful thing because it gives you all the time in the world to create customer intimacy, to do customer development, to ask lots of questions, to really uncover big opportunities if you're open-minded and not biased about it. And at the right time, when you have the software, it's going to be much easier for you to launch and get gain traction and have success with it. You just have to be mindful and oftentimes patient about the transition. I hope this was useful. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. If you have any thoughts, stories to share, tactics um, that you want to offer up, just shoot me an email at stelly at close.io. Always happy to hear from you. If you have not done that already yet, go to blog.close.io and subscribe to our blog. 
twice a week, highly tactical, highly practical advice on sales and startups. And until then, and next time, let's go out there and let's get it.